Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. You know, lying has been around since the first man and woman, and the lie they believe continues to impact the human race. Of course, lies come in all shapes and sizes, and they all have consequences. Though men and women encounter lies, there's often a difference in the way a man faces and makes decisions, which is often rooted in pride. The lies a man will face relate to his view of God, his sins, his marriage, his family, his work, his wealth, and the world. In Lies Men Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free, best-selling author and speaker Robert Wolgamuth guides men to understand the lies they will surely face. Lies that can cause them loss, pain, ruined relationships, and losing out on the satisfaction that obeying God's Word promises. Robert is the best-selling author of over 20 books, including She Calls Me Daddy, The Notes to the Dad's Devotional Bible, The Most Important Place on Earth and What's in the Bible, co-written with the late R.C. Sproul. Robert grew up in a home where truth-telling was a big deal. The fourth child of a German Mennonite pastor, Robert and his five siblings, knew the high value their parents placed on the absolute accuracy of every word spoken at home. Even exaggerations were verboten, so writing a book denouncing lies makes a lot of sense. Robert is married to Nancy DeMoss Volgamuth. He has two married daughters, two son-in-laws, five grandchildren, and one grandson-in-law. Joining us now to talk about his new release, Lies Men Believe, and the truth that sets him free is Robert Wolgamuth. Robert, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Well, I'm so grateful for the chance to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Well, you've had such a unique journey, uh, which began with a German Mennonite pastor father. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So your introduction to the loving, graceful, forgiving uh, merciful and um, boundless love of Christ was delivered to you in a very direct, unbreakable, unshakable, immovable, incorruptible truth that it was the truth that you were going to know and the truth that you were going to speak or else. Right. Or else. <clears throat> right. Well, and it's interesting. And thank you. I feel welcome to your family. Uh, because of the, um, the Mennonite roots, there wasn't a lot of grace to go around. Mm-hmm. We were, um, I'm going to say we were pretty legalistic. Uh, in fact, we could spot a non-Christian on a Sunday morning at worship because they wore colors. Everybody else wore black, dark gray. Sometimes if somebody really wanted to go out on the limb, navy blue. Uh, no, uh, no jewelry. Men wore beards like yours, except no mustache. Mustaches were worldly. So like you see Amish men wearing, just the beard, beard not the mustache. Women wore coverings. And... Um, and we were very conscious of the world and did our very best to isolate ourselves from the world. So worldly, that was a big word that we used. And, and this was multi-generational. My grandparents, I didn't know my great grandparents, but my grandparents, both grandfathers were pastors in this same denomination. Uh, they drove cars. This was not the Amish. They drove cars. However, they were, they were always black. And there was a strain, you probably are aware, a strain of Mennonites that even painted their bumpers black rather than showing the chrome. And they were known as black bumper Mennonites. So that's, th- those are my roots. Now, let me just make clear that I'm very grateful for my roots. My parents are in heaven now. Um, but I'm very grateful for what I learned. I'm very grateful that my parents loved God's word, trusted God's word, uh, were deep. Um, people of prayer, I, I was wakened every morning, every morning of my life to the sound of my father praying downstairs. His resonant voice would kind of reverberate through the house. And I knew my daddy was on his knees and he was praying for us. So going through rebellion as a teenager and so forth, I knew of myself 
as a kid that was prayed for on a regular basis. Uh, family devotions after meals was, um, was traditional, was uh, non-negotiable. Uh, Mealtime was a huge thing. We were very much like the Italians when it came to meals. They were sacred. Italian, the Italians talk about the sacred table. Um, and, you know, I'd be out in the back playing with my buddies. We'd be called in for dinner. They'd be called in for dinner. I mean, before we finish saying grace, they're back out there. And we're sitting around the table for a long time. I'm going to say 60 to 90 minutes on the average every dinner time. And even though as a kid, I didn't like that. I wanted to go back out with my buddies. Looking back on it, I can't tell you how deeply grateful I am for my parents' commitment to that table and to sitting around and learning how to listen to each other, learning how to love each other verbally and, and ask good questions. My parents saying, what did God tell you today? How, how did you hear his voice? Those kinds of things, they are, they are concrete in the foundation of my soul. And I'm deeply grateful for them. So that's my, that's my roots. Robert, what part of the country did you grow up in? I was born in Pennsylvania. My parents were Lancaster County people. I was born in South Central Pennsylvania, a town called Waynesboro, and then moved to Wheaton, Illinois, after a two-year stint in Japan as missionaries. So I grew up in Wheaton, Illinois. Okay. I'm originally from Pittsburgh. I'm a Penn State alum, so I know <laughs> okay. Lancaster and then the, and the Mennonite community quite well. And uh, w one of the things that I always admired about the community was it actually was a community. Was. And it was family related to family, and they came to the aid of each other. It was, uh, I, have a, I have a common phrase that says that if you have to call yourself an Acts chapter two church, you're probably not one. Mm -hmm. uh, that the wow. Mennonite community and the Amish community actually live out more of the upper room and more of having uh, lack of uh, not, not needing things and taking care of each other and sharing with each other than any denomination of Christianity uh, across the world. Yes, uh, it yes. Is, my, it da is. my daddy was an only child, so I have no cousins on that side. My mother had seven siblings. That's 350 people. And missionaries, doctors, teachers, they're everywhere in that family. It's an amazing group of people. So I, that's a, you're, you're exactly right. That's, that's my heritage. I'm very grateful for it, but uh, that's it, right. It, it's, it's important that the foundation of truth. Now, as a child, uh, you had uh, this upbringing, but of course we still have the raging cup of hormones of our teen years that says that regardless of the cage, the corral, the uh, borders, we're going to find a way to uh, stretch, push, and, and create our identity. How was that process for you growing up in such a structure? Well, I, I tell you, I mean, this is, this is the truth. I didn't really go through much of a rebellion. I have an older sibling who did. And I watched my parents with him and resolved that that didn't look like a lot of fun. And so my rebellion was as much intellectual as it was physical. You know, I, I, I went through the questioning of who God is and, and how he and I were involved with each other, if you would, the, the role of the church, all those things. But my daddy was pretty strict. That would be the understatement. Whatever else you hear today, that's the understatement of the day. Um, but you know what? My mother mitigated so much of his strictness. So she became like a mediator. She was, she was the person that I would go to and say, you know, dad is really hard on me. I don't understand this. And so she, she lovingly would sort of help me see him. She, she was like his agent, right? She would say, well, your daddy's under a lot of stress. I guarantee you, your daddy loves you. I hear him pray for you every night. So uh, I, my, my rebellion as a teenager was pretty guarded. Uh, I probably went through more of that in college when I was out on my own, free to do what I wanted to do. But in high school, until I was 17, went off to college, uh, pretty straight and narrow. And it wasn't, it wasn't like 
resisting it and fighting it. That's kind of the way it was. So you went from a world of structure to a world of unstructure. How was that transition for you? And what was it that carried forward with you? What did you bring with you that helped you to accomplish what it is you've accomplished? Uh, well, several things. Um, probably until my sophomore year in college, maybe the beginning of my junior year, uh, I was pretty wayward. Um, again, I went to a Christian college, so I only did as much as I could get away with. And then really through the, the witness of one of my classmates whose sister came to visit him. In fact, I saw him two weeks ago, whose sister came to visit him. Um, he grew up in Wheaton where I grew up. On the way home, she was in a horrendous car accident, eventually died. But I went to the hospital in Wabash, Indiana with my friend Scott. We sat there in the waiting room waiting for his sister to die. And the Lord spoke to me and he spoke to me about the brevity of life. He spoke to me about the important things in my life and where I was headed, what I was doing today that was going to lead me to where I was going to be tomorrow. It's incredible. I mean, I'll never forget. This is 54 years ago. I'll never forget it. It's a powerful thing in my life. So, um, I mean, really at that point, uh, I clicked in and, um, and I, I began to take the word more seriously. I began to take accountability with my friends more seriously. Um, really in many ways connected with my parents in a new way as an adult, not just their kid. Uh, began to read, um, was exposed to theologians, uh, people like R.C. Sproul, you mentioned R.C., um, played a, a, a large role in my growing up. Then of course went into the publishing business, so I was surrounded by books, which I continue to love. So I had no, I had no design on writing. Um, I was exposed to the publishing business first through the magazine business, a magazine called Campus Life Magazine, published by Youth for Christ. I spent six years in the ministry of Youth for Christ working with high school kids, and I looked into the faces of high school kids who were searching, and they were blunt, right? They would say, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, there's no diplomacy in a high school kid. They right. don't know what that means. So it really was a great experience for me in terms of searching my own heart in terms of what my what what my walk with Christ really was, nothing phony there. They didn't allow that, so that was very important. That was six years in the ministry of Youth for Christ, and then got involved in publishing, first in Waco, Texas, then as president of Thomas Nelson in Nashville, Tennessee, then starting my own publishing company with my colleague named Michael Hyatt, and then actually starting an agency out of that. Sold that business, started an agency, and I've represented authors. We have about 200 Christian authors that we do all of their contract work, all of their publishing work, uh, the go between the author and the publishing company negotiating the contract. So I have about 200 clients. That keeps me very busy in addition to writing. It's wonderful. When would you say that you had the moment that you began to realize that God's truth was going to be your truth? Now, this was indoctrinated because that was your father's message, but it had to become your own. And we're not talking about this, this uh, encounter with Jesus and your, your uh, cathartic moment there about the brevity of life. We're talking about when did you grab a hold of what God says is true and what man says is distorted, and I'm going to attack it from lies that women believe and lies that men believe and I'm going to be able to call it for what it is but I first have to own the truth. I have yeah. to own the authentic before I can expose the counterfeit. I'd love to be able to say well I was on a horse on my way to Damascus and uh, bam there it was I saw Jesus in the sky. It's not like that really. Um, I mean I would say it was it was progressing uh, from the time, as I said, that moment in the hospital in Wabash, Indiana, uh, through the remainder of my college years, then spending six years in ministry, and then getting involved in the publishing business, being exposed to the very bright, um, doctrinally sound authors, writers, speakers. So, you know, I would I would say that it was it was a process and continues to be a process. Um, 
you know, I'm very grateful for the roots that I have. And I would say that the fruit began to grow as um, as a late teenager and then into my 20s and 30s and so forth. Uh, again, just being exposed to men of faith and women of faith whose uh, whose model I emulated. You know, in, in my business, I have the opportunity of knowing and loving lots and lots of authors and speakers whose whose example underscores their ministry. It's not there's no conflict there. And I'm deeply grateful for that kind of thing. So I'm going to say it was a process Um you know, I, I know exactly when I invited Jesus into my heart. I was four years old. And you, you hear stories about, you know, at my mother's knee, that's exactly what happened. In fact, Dr. Erwin Lutzer, I don't know if you know Erwin, he's a close friend. But he and I were comparing notes. And I said, Erwin, how did you come to faith in Christ? And he told me this story about going to a movie as a kid, which wasn't normal. But this was a movie about a guy named Red Harper who was a country singer out of Texas. And there was a movie called Mr. Texas on his life. And and Irwin said, when I was six years old, I went to this movie with my parents, knelt there in the theater or auditorium, whatever, and received Jesus as my savior. And I looked at Irwin and I said, that is exactly my story. Same movie, I was only four, I was sitting with my mother. The, the movie Mr. Texas uh, inspired me to invite Jesus into my heart. So that was, 66 years ago, and I'm very grateful for it. Well, that's very exciting. You know, you would appreciate the fact that uh, I've spent the last two years, I do three of these live interviews a day. Uh, oh I get exposed to people that I would never have the opportunity to meet, such as yourself, uh, Stacy and John Eldridge, uh, Kevin and Sam Sorbo, Dr. Gary Chapman, uh, David Barton, some great names that you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. that have been guests on my program that we make this personal connection because we do it kind of like Phil Donahue, uh, Pat Robertson, and Rush Limbaugh all merged <laughs> all merged in together. That's clear. Uh, that makes perfect sense to me. I get it. You know, we want to relate to you, but we're going to yeah. challenge you. And if you waver off a of biblical truth, we're going to we're just going to hem you in and uh, cut you off with the past. Exactly. And, yeah. and uh, right. it's not going to be on this program. We have no commercials. We have no sponsors. We have no advertisers. And we're going to cover biblical truth, whether it makes you squirm in your seat. Our message mm -hmm. is if we've stepped on your toes, we'll ask you to move your feet. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're not changing the message. And I love so, it. And so I'm going to use that. I'm going to tweet that and take credit for it. Well, there you go. And you, you have my permission to do so okay. because <laughs> uh, uh, I have stolen so many in my life that I owe so many for there you all, go. all of those. I love um, it. In this book, Lies Men Believe in the Truth That Sets Them Free, uh, you address uh, the fact that there is a difference in the deceptions that men and women face. And you, uh, uh, over a million copies of lies women believe. Uh, you've now introduced lies men believe. And it really is a grab a hold of you and assess your masculinity, assess your created in the image of God, understanding that he created both that, that he was the compound unity, both male and female, and that we have to, as believers in the Bible, embrace the fullness of every word, not just the ones that we like or the Amen. ones that we can use for our convenience. And uh, often we say that women are more spiritual. Uh, I think that is one of the lies that men believe. Uh, because look at the number of prophets in the Bible that were men. Uh, yeah, amen. Look at the writers of the New Testament, <clears throat> they're all men. So to say and use that as a lame excuse, well, women are just more spiritual. Well, I take a look at the authors of this book, which was the, supernat the most supernatural download in the world, and every chapter with the exception of, of uh, two, Right, uh, Esther and Ruth, right? Uh, are, are, so 64 men, two women, how do you justify women are more spiritual? Uh, <clears throat> right, so, that's right. So it's, it, it, it gets to be kind of lame uh, that men have assigned spirituality to women 
and it is a condition of our church today that men and the fatherless uh, are impacting our society in a way that is destructive. And it's time that we took a look at the man in the mirror. It's time we assessed what we believed. It's time that we challenged old thinking uh, and embraced God's truth and said, you know what, I don't care what I believe today. I'm willing to throw it all out if I just would know the truth. Yes. And if Amen. I approach it from that standpoint, <clears throat> my life is going to be changed. We're talking yes. with Robert Wolgamuth, author of Lies Men Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. We're going to dig into the content of this book after this break and really examine some of the things that lies men believe about God, about themselves, about sin, about sexuality. Uh, it is filled with an inyourface.com approach that says that we're going to call you out and hopefully wives, you'll get this for your husband. Mothers, you'll get this for your sons. Fathers, you'll examine it for yourself, and you'll be able to impart on the needs with your children and your grandchildren on your knees the real truth. And that truth is the one truth, and that's the truth of God and Amen. His Word, and that's the truth that will set you free. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day, you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, 
we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices and who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Robert Wolgamuth, author of Lies Men Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. Robert, welcome back to the program. Thank you. It's my privilege. Robert, you write that Adam knew what he was doing when he sinned in the garden. And, I believe that. And, and I yeah. believe that, too. Help our yeah. audience understand that that was, <laughs> uh, um, it was not accidental. It was rather, rather intentional. Uh, when when I sat down and began working on this manuscript, and actually I did it sitting next to my wife, uh, Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, and um, she had written Lies Women Believe, sold a million copies of that. And she opens her book with the story of Eve being deceived by the serpent in the garden. And so we talked about what's the approach, what's the foundation to this book, Lies Men Believe. And the question we asked each other was, well, was Adam deceived? And we turned to the, uh, to the epistle to Timothy, the apostle Paul, who says, quote, Eve was deceived, Adam was not. All right, so let's make that, let's make that clear. That's, I mean, the apostle Paul said that. So, so what was Adam? What how do we describe that experience from his perspective? Well, the Lord had told him, had given him the instructions about the tree, right? And so he must have told his wife about that conversation that he had had with the Lord. So now Genesis 3 turns to this interaction between the serpent and Eve. And so I said to Nancy, I wonder where Adam was during that conversation. When you read into the text, and you see that Eve took the fruit and ate of it. And then what's the next line? She gave it to her husband. Well, unless she was really had a great arm, she didn't throw the thing across the garden. She probably handed it to him, which means right. that he was probably there. You don't have to be really that smart to figure that out. So, but I'd never thought about it. Not until I put the lens on this book and said, Lord, where do I start? So, okay, let's say that Adam had the instructions, told his wife, now he's standing there when she's interacting with the, with the serpent. She, she, she disobeys God. She takes the, the, the fruit. Of course, you see on the cover, I know it wasn't an apple, but the cover of the book has an apple with two bites, which I thought the art director nailed it on that. So what did Adam do? Well, I think the answer to that is he did nothing. In fact, passivity is, I think, one of the great, problems with men in our culture. Um, you know, I think many men are afraid of their wives. They're afraid of speaking. They're afraid of the truth. They're afraid of their children. You know, this, how many generations have we had where the kids are smarter than their parents? Well, they all, we, we've always thought that, but now their access to the internet, their access to their computers and their, and their smartphones. I mean, how many times you've seen a child help their parent or the grandparent navigate their way around electronics. It happens all the time. So you've got, you've got children who are 
not being led, not being parented, not being fathered by their dads. So anyway, the, the passive, the, f- the fear that what I was talking about. In fact, I got married 35 and a half months ago. I lost my first wife in 2014 to two and a half years of cancer. She was, she was a warrior. She was amazing. She had a very good friend named Nancy Lee DeMoss. Two months before she, Bobby stepped into heaven, she told two friends that she would love for Robert to marry Nancy Lee DeMoss. But she never told me that. So two months after Nancy and I were dating, and I knew Nancy professionally as, as her agent for a period of time, those two friends said, this is exactly what Bobby wanted you to do. So, you know, we felt like that was a great confirmation. I'm glad that I didn't know before I started to date Nancy or it would have felt like an assignment. Right. But in this case, it felt like a confirmation for which I'm grateful. So anyway, back to Adam. Oh, what I was going to say is in our wedding, I think you'll love this. In our wedding, of course, we're grown ups now. Nancy's 67 and I'm I mean, I'm 67. She's 57. Never married. So we're talking through our ceremony, and I said, you know what? I have an idea. How often you have you been to a wedding? In fact, all the weddings you've been to, the bride walks all the way down the center aisle, maybe on her daddy's arm. In this case, Nancy was on her brother's arm because her daddy went to heaven 40 years ago. I said, I want you to stop. I want you and Mark to stop halfway down, and I'm going to st- step out from where I'm standing, and I'm going to come get you. I, I don't like the idea of me passively standing there waiting for your brother to meet or to bring you to me. I'm going to come get you. This is this is the, the epistle to John. You know, we love him because he went first. He right. loved us. I love that. So anyway, that's what we did. That's a, a side note. So um, I married Nancy in 2015. And and so this this has been our this has been our journey. But uh Back, back to Adam and Eve. So I married this woman who's 57 years old, and we talked about getting married. And as it turned out, I moved to Michigan. I lived in Florida, which goes to show you how much I love this lady. Uh, you know, palm trees are overrated. What can I say? So I moved to Michigan and um, turned in my driver's license in January uh, creating a, a Florida license in for a Michigan license. So, um, so Nancy would say to me, all right, so we're, we're going to move into the same house. And so like, where are we going to, where are we going to do this? And how are we going to do this? And where are we going to go to church? And my answer was the same answer that Adam must have given to himself. I said, we'll work this out. We'll figure this out. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. And I I really meant that. Well, that's, I think, the opening salvo in Adam's sin. He knew exactly what he was doing. I think when David abused Bathsheba, and I think this wasn't adultery, I think it was rape. Because he's the power guy. What choice did she have? This was not consensual. That's a different subject. But... I believe that King David, who knew so much better, thought to himself, I'll cross this bridge when I get there. Of course, he had this dilemma with her husband. And of course, what's he going to do? Because Uriah doesn't go sleep with her. So he's not going to be able to pass off her pregnancy to, to Uriah, right? So I believe, I do, I believe that within a few days of the episode, David's on to the next thing. He's off doing his kingly things and organizing wars, got on to the next thing. He figured down the road, I'll put all this together. And I believe that's what Adam thought. So the, the conclusion that Nancy and I came to in terms of, so if, if Eve was deceived and Adam was not, what was Adam? Adam, I think sheer pride and some passivity said to himself, I know I'm doing the wrong thing. In fact, Let's you and I sit down with pastors, Christian leaders, Christian authors, men who have in the last few years fallen publicly, profoundly, tragically, and we would have a cup of coffee with them and we would say to them, we would ask them, did you know that you were doing the wrong thing? Did you know that sleeping with the organist or your secretary was the wrong thing? What would they say? Absolutely. Everyone. I don't think... I don't think your conscience can get that seared. I think those guys 
knew what they were doing. And so you'd say to them, so why? What was going on in your brain? And he would say, I figured down the road, I'd take care of it somehow. I'd figure it out. I'm smart enough. I'm a good enough negotiator. Somehow I'd be able to get out of this thing. And I think that's exactly what Adam was thinking. Robert, early in my business career, I was a uh, sales manager for AT&T. And they moved me from Atlanta to Los Angeles. And I, this was right after the phone company broke up and AT&T spun off all the Bell System companies. And I was Baby with, Bells. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was with the Southern Bell and I went to AT&T to California. And we had a process within the organization where salespeople got promoted if they could certify and write up a sale in a particular way. They had to have three of them and their sales manager had to sign off on them. And right. so I was uh, newly elevated, newly promoted to this position and I had this sales team and they would bring me their sales and I would interview them about their sales and they would be convincing and I would sign off on them. And one day I got a phone call from Human Resources and they said, we need to see you right away. And I said, what about? They said, we'll talk to you when you get here. And they said, um, you have a salesperson in your organization that has lied about the process in which he used to make this sale. We've spoken to the client. It did not happen this way and we are holding you responsible for it, and we are demoting you one level and oh, for six no. months and cutting your pay for six months to that level. And I said, I didn't lie. I didn't do this thing. Why am I being punished? And they spoke these words to me, and it's been with me for over 40 years. Because you did not create an environment in which your staff could completely understand that any violation of the company policy would be unacceptable. And therefore, you are going to draft a statement which we will incorporate into our sales training manuals so that every leader in the organization has this document that they will read to their organization expressing to them that the company will not tolerate in any way, shape, or form a violation of company policy. Now, you're the one that got caught up in this. You're the one that's going to have to draft that compelling message, and that's what will convince us that you've really learned that you were responsible for not creating the environment. Adam was responsible for not wow. conveying the message because God never spoke to Eve. There's no record God right. of ever giving the instruction to Eve. That's right. So, Clearly. At, so I was in the role of Adam where I had not clearly conveyed the message, which would have been not only don't go near the tree, but the tree is in zip code 31117. I don't <laughs> even want you in the same zip code. Okay. The zip code is forbidden. You're in area code 907. I'm moving you to area code 404. Okay, you're never going to ever get near that tree. I'm going to make sure that there's a fence around it. And I could have, there was no prohibition of him building a fence, a gate, a wall, or doing anything. But he did nothing except pass along a message in a passive way right, that allowed her the latitude to embellish yes. what it was she was told. So clearly... He was responsible, and I learned that lesson from AT&T. It stuck with me all of my life as one of the most, and so when I read about Adam and I agree with you, Adam was responsible because he did not create and convey a fear of the Lord and what the real message was as to how the forbidden tree was forbidden, don't go near it, this was your dad. That's right. This was your dad. This is what he created right. for you. That exactly. even when you strayed, you had a plumb line and you had a tether that pulled you back to honesty, transparency, so much so that I would say that your father is actually the true author of this book. Amen. Because he's the one that instilled with you such a regimented view of the difference between a slight fabrication, 99, do you remember ivory soap? Yeah, 99.44. Uh, 
40, what was it? 99 and 44, 100 percent. Or 100 percent. Pure, right? <laughs> okay, now, through a biblical lens, it was 0.56 percent poison. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Because 99 percent true in the Bible is 100 percent false to the Lord. Amen. And yeah. this is the message of your book, is that we've allowed ourselves to drift into a compromising position where we think that the little bit of leaven does not spoil the whole batch. But one lie is one step over the line, and it might take you a lifetime to return. Amen. Uh, I, I, thank you for your story about AT&T. I worked for the American Broadcasting Company. I worked for one of their divisions in Texas. And they would send in auditors who would spend like four of those guys at a little conference table, and they would open everything. There was nothing that was hidden from them at all. And guess what the first thing that they would look for in all of their audit? Expense reports. Expense reports. And that's exactly what you're saying, that either you're lying on your expense reports or one of your direct reports is lying on their expense reports. Either case, it's your deal. It's your bad. And that's that I'll never forget that. I got, I mean, I, I bought, I, I had a sales force that answered to me. I bought them running shoes. This was back in the days when Jim Fix wrote a book about running, right? right? So I bought running shoes thinking these guys are going to, going to get in shape, right? They're out on the road. They're spending a lot of time in their car, eating at restaurants. And I got dinged on that. I had to pay for those because we don't buy running shoes. But the point is your expense report, that's your life, right? It's just you and that document. And unless somebody really audits you carefully, you're going to get away with a lie. You think you're going to get away with a lie. That's a powerful story. Biblical copper, and, and, and you know, we can get into the lies. Men believe that uh, I'm not responsible for my actions. I can hide my sin. It doesn't hurt anybody. It only hurts me. Uh, my faith and my work are unrelated. Um, I can't help myself. Uh, all, all, all these other things. All these things. I, but the bottom line is, is that we are shuckers and jivers with the Lord. Uh, we, act right. we actually spit in the face of the sovereign God who we absolutely have convinced ourselves that there is a dark darling in our heart that is private and we can keep in this place that God cannot see. And we've allowed ourselves to buy into that deception, which is the root of all of these deceptions and many of them are really quite obvious, uh, but some of them are really quite insidious and quite detrimental and are eroding at um, what we would call Christianity, which is not Christianity at all. The pastors in the pulpit are not preaching this transparency. The small groups are not preaching this transparency. Men are involved in sexual sin through pornography, through adultery, uh, in so many ways because they've lied to themselves that these are victimless crimes or that who is it really hurting? But it is a huge moral compromise and a huge biblical compromise to even allow one of these right. lies, let alone even one, let alone all that you cover in this book. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would love to just jump in here if I might. In fact, I thought of this as I was praying about this conversation with you. I went to, to lie number 16. And I think this is so basic to the men we're talking about and talking to. Uh, we, we've talked, we've spent some time talking about my background, and I've expressed my gratitude for it. Yes. But the word holiness, uh, lie 16, is holiness is boring. And, you know, you and I live in a culture where men love the euphoria, the excitement, driving a fast car, throwing a touchdown pass, all those really thrilling things. <clears throat> holiness is a boring concept to many men. And in fact, 
it, it is so foundational to who we need to be. You know, when I was a kid, holiness was actually the adjective of a campground, holiness camp, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Roxbury, holiness camp. And as a little boy, I'd go with my grandparents. I mean, that looked like anything but fun. I mean, it was horrible. I couldn't wait to get out of those meetings. But the older I get, the more grateful I am for grandparents and parents that leaned in on me and talked about the power, the wonder of holiness. And so I mean that if I if I could say one thing, because I've had the, the privilege of lots of conversations and people say like, so what's the most important lie? What's and it was last night that I actually thought that I would love to just say to you and to your precious audience, holiness is a huge thing. And if I mean this this becomes the antidote to lots of these other lies. If I'm committed to obedience and holiness before Christ, everything changes. You know, it's such a short passage in the Bible. Five words. Be holy because I am holy. Uh, six words. Six words. Yeah, I got it. Too. Thank you. Six You're words. Welcome. Be holy because I am holy. Christ died on the cross for us to give us an example of what it was to lay down your life for another. And Paul wrote, there's no great, uh, or Jesus said that, that uh, no greater gift than this than for one man to lay down his life for another. Uh, the fact that my sin is forgiven and I have defaulted to the position, well, all of my righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None are good, no, not one. Every inclination of the heart of man's heart is wicked. The heart is evil above all else. Who can know it? Then I'm just in this fallen state, and it should be expected of me to live in a fallen state. God has proclaimed that over me. But yet, yet, he desires a relationship, and every one of these lies is not a speed bump. It is actually a Jericho wall That's that right. places us in between God. And in this journey towards holiness is not boring. In this journey towards holiness, what, what, who was it? Was it Cromwell that said or, or Churchill, I have met the enemy and the enemy the is enemy me? The enemy is me, yes. Uh, this Cromwell. Is, Cromwell. This, this, this is our journey with the Lord, we are our own worst enemies, but what is going to be the catalyst to change? And I think that is the bottom line message to the book, is yeah. that what the product, the ROI, the return on investment, the payback period, is you're going to be a better husband, a better father, a better child of the king, you're going to be a better businessman, you're going to be a better person, you're going to be a better minister of the gospel in your own home. You're going to fulfill the calling that Paul has given you as a minister of reconciliation. The, the, the command that Paul gave you that you are an ambassador for God as a new creation in Christ and you are speaking the very words of God. Have you been giving glory to God? Or are you an embarrassment? And have you been lifting up the sole of your foot to every Saudi right, as an affront to them? Or have you been like George Bush throwing up at a meal in Japan, which is the greatest offense of all in creating a national uh, state uh, department embarrassment. Uh, as an ambassador of heaven, how are you reflecting Christ in your life, in your work, in your family? And is it time for you to stop using the excuse? And is it time for you to man up? Amen. And that yeah. is the heart of this book, Lies Men Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. We're getting ready to be uh, entering into the holiday buying season. Right. And I think that every wife should get this. Every pastor should be given this. Every youth leader should be given this. Every husband should be given this. Every father should sit down and read it every day with his son. Amen. That's right. 
and do what Robert's father did with him, and that is sit around the table and talk about these things. And there are, in this book, there are, uh, let me get the right number, uh, 40. 40. Specific lies that men believe, and this will fill up many a year's worth of discussion around the table. And if you were to take that and his wife's book, Lies Women Believe, and put them side by side, that dinnertime conversation would radically change. That bedside conversation with your son would radically change. And the one who changes most in the process is going to be you. You the oh. dad, you the father, you the son that are going to learn that you're raising up the next generation of husbands, you're raising up the next generation of fathers, and unless you want to stop the truth in its tracks and you want to just let it all work out, let your kid choose his own faith system, I want my kids to be whatever they want to be, well, that's a lie that you've been buying into because the average age that someone accepts the Lord is 21 and under. That means your job is in the home. It's not the youth pastor's job. That's it's right. not the senior pastor's job. It's your job. And you yeah. bought into these lies, and every lie you believe into, you will pass down generation to generation, Lador of Ador, generation to generation. If you believe it, they're going to believe it because they're going to see it in you. And when they see the change in you, well, you can actually confess that you bought into a false truth and tell them how and tell them why. You're going to be a better father, a better husband, a better man, a better minister, and a better member of the community. And isn't that what you desire for your life? God says, be holy because I am holy. It's not boring. It's proud. It's upright. And you're standing six inches taller because you're standing on this. Amen not on the platform of man. Robert Amen. Wolgamuth, I wish I had more time with you. We have so much more to talk about. Uh, we are one of those situations where spirit recognizes spirit. Amen. And, and I appreciate Thank you very you. much. The book is Lies Men Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. Uh, Moody Publishers, a fabulous publishing house. Author Robert Wolgamuth, get a copy of it. Go to ignitingnation.com. Click on Books and Media, scroll down, get a copy for yourself. As a matter of fact, don't just use one copy. Get it for every man you know in your life, every yep. man you can think of, father, son, grandfather. It's never too late to have this conversation with every man in your family. May the, Lord, may the Lord bless you and keep you, Robert, and your new Thank bride. You. And may Thank he you. just pour out his spirit upon you oh, and I'm bless so grateful. you. Thank you so much. In fact, in fact, if you wouldn't mind turning people to page 300, there's a website that's the discussion guide, and it will help fathers and sons and you and your small group of friends go through this book uh, one lie at a time. Liesmenbelieve.com forward slash discussion guide. Go there and get a copy for yourself. Robert, thank you thank so you. much for being God with us here. You. God thank bless you. God bless you, my ministry. friend. Shalom, shalom. We're going to take shalom. a short break, and when we come back, We'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.